Recording in progress. Okay, great. Okay, uh, great. Hear me okay. You can hear myself. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I, I apologize. I'm not going to be doing uh, today's lecture in front of the blackboard. I wanted to go to my office, but it turns out for July 4th, they've actually shut down a whole bunch of streets like where I am. So it's kind of crazy to actually leave my house. Um, so I'm actually going to revert to uh, some notes, which, uh, which I'll present, but actually will be probably a little bit easier to follow just because it's going to be uh, on a shared screen. Um, uh, before I start, actually, I, I, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to um, uh, uh, thank Pyong Wan just for sending a bunch of very interesting questions, which I think folks had about the lectures, UTNs, my own. And I thought I'd address a bunch in the beginning, which wouldn't be addressed in the lecture, and then in the lecture address the rest. Because uh, they're actually really excellent questions. Because there's a whole kind of you know basic uh, 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 question when you encounter this, which is like how much is general? Okay. Uh, there are a lot of questions about whether and how uh, these methods apply to scalar particles outside of four dimensions. So that's great because I'm going to be dealing entirely in general dimensions in my bootstrap talk uh, today, and I'm also going to be considering scalars at, at length uh, in this lecture and next lecture. Uh, so you'll, we'll get to that shortly, but there was, a, a, I think, a very interesting um, uh, and, and important question, which was about the general context in which amplitudes is actually applicable. Okay? Amplitudes as the general S matrix program is a perturbative procedure, which you'll see. It's a bootstrap, which makes assumptions about, uh, you know, functions, which need to have, you know, constrained structure. That is to say that they enter uh, in very specific uh, forms in uh, uh, very specific functions of the external uh, kinematics. If you ask things about beyond perturbation theory, in principle, very complicated uh, objects in terms of the analytic structure and dependence of the external kinematics, it's much more complicated. So you get asked, it, to what extent does anything apply non-perturbatively? There is, of course, uh, an old non-perturbative bootstrap, and there's actually a, a reinvigoration and uh, a, a repurposing of those tools actually in the present day. Uh, if you're interested in that, I won't talk about it. There is a whole non-perturbative uh, S matrix bootstrap that's been applied to N equals to four superangles, which is basically building a huge class, a giant class of functions, much broader than the class that we'll study at tree level and, and low orders. Uh, in fact, these are just the functions that would describe the full theory at finite coupling. There's also a non-perturbative bootstrap for uh, um, in two dimensions, in low dimensions, uh, for for uh, 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 kind of pion and strong interaction type physics, uh, that also has uh, kind of very interesting uh, recent work, uh, which I could point you to uh, maybe offline. I'll, I'll I'll send the link for some of those things. But the, the the basic point is there's been very little progress, I would say, in applying most of these ideas non perturbatively, uh, because it's very hard. Okay. That said. Uh, and I'll get to this in the, in the kind of later lectures, a lot of the lessons we'll learn from amplitudes, like the double copy, like uh, oh, color kinematics duality, various structures have uh, in some cases, direct connection to things that go beyond perturbation theory and all loop orders. But also, you know, when you see a structured all loop orders in the S matrix in perturbation theory, it suggests that it should be non-perturbative, but there's, you know, no direct progress in many cases to actually making that connection. So if you like, that's like a really interesting open question. You find structures that appear in all orders in perturbation theory. Maybe they break down because of you know instanton effects, but it, it, we don't know the answer to, to whether they persist, uh, at least for some of these structures. Um, so that's one thing I'll say. And I think maybe everything else, um, well, there's uh, other questions about, uh, 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 which I think I'll kind of touch on in the rest of this lecture. So maybe with that, I'll, I'll just kind of jump into things. Okay, and, and also I know that there was a microphone at some point, so maybe I would even encourage that if they can, you can pass a microphone around and ask questions during the talk, it might be easier even if you don't wait to the end. Um, but if you if you wanna wait, that's fine too. Okay, so let, let, me, let me get started. Hopefully I can share my screen properly. Um, I think you can see, uh, you should be able to see my broadcast. Just uh, let me know if there's a problem. Okay, so hopefully I think you can see my screen. Okay, uh, just let me know if you can't. Okay, so um, as you can see, uh, I will at some point post these lecture notes uh, or I'll, I'll give them to the organizers to post. Uh, I figured this will be maybe easier for me to kind of go through them as, as we discuss. 
Uh, okay, so here we got this. All right, cool. So hopefully, I think you can also see this uh, highlighting. All right, so uh, as, as I said last time, today's topic uh, is going to be the bootstrap in kind of general terms. I do know that uh, Uteen went through um, the bootstrap and talk, uh, talked about three particle scattering, kind of the, the, uh, the simple story in, in four dimensions, a kind of very fascinating and incredibly uh, powerful uh, uh, principle, which lets you just you know, derive all, all three-point functions uh, from massless particles and maybe in, in massive in many cases. Uh, I'm going to do this essentially in general dimensions. Okay, I want to kind of convey that this is something which transcends four dimensions if you, for whatever reason, want to go beyond that. Um, but also to illustrate kind of the general principle. Okay, uh, but but I want to outline the, the, the principles of the bootstrap, which I, I think uh, you can uh, uh, did. But let me go through it again. Um, what are the principles that we're going to be imposing? Okay, so first and foremost, and this is almost an afterthought, there's dimensional analysis, okay? Uh, it, this almost goes without saying, uh, it, it's really just consistency. But uh, what I wanna kind of highlight is that, you know, we have scattering amplitudes that uh, uh, have a certain fixed dimension, just given the fact that they're ultimately, you know, inner products of Ketz and some Hilbert space. So this is fixed on general grounds. And then we have, if you like, dimensionality of coupling constants. Okay. Now you might say coupling constants. There's no Lagrangian. What do you mean? What I really mean is that you know whenever we build an ansatz for some amplitude, we're implicitly telling you the dimensionality of the coupling constant. Okay. So if, if for instance I, I give you some uh, Lagrangian and there's some number of momenta, you know if I count the dimension of the momenta and I compare it to the dimension that the amplitude has to be, then that's giving me the dimensionality of whatever coupling constant is secretly sitting in front. Okay, so when I say G Yang Mills is zero and four D or G Newton is uh, as units of length squared and, and, and equals to four, I, I, don't, I don't mean that I'm assuming those as my starting theories. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, if you like, uh, uh, whatever ansatz I write down, I want to assume that there's some consistent dimensionality of a coupling constant in play. Okay, uh, uh, it really, it's just a way of organizing uh, 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 the, the dimensions that show up in, in actual kinematic momenta versus coupling constants. Again, that's all I mean when I say that I'm, I'm highlighting these. Okay, um, so it's really almost just consistency. For Lorentz invariance, of course, everything needs to be functions of uh, pi dot pj, inner products of, of uh, d momenta. Uh, or if you're in 4D, you can use spinner helicity. And of course, even if you're in general D, you could have epsilon tensor, levy chivita type contractions, which I'll, I'm not gonna consider here, but you can add to the entire story I'll discuss. Okay, now uh, pro probably I would say the most important part of the S matrix bootstrap is the assumption of factorization. Okay, I wanna be precise here because sometimes it's described as locality um, uh, or even maybe even a more extreme abusive notation causality, but it's really just factorization. And the statement is simple. It says that if you take an amplitude okay, or if you're building the amplitude from first principles as a function, then it naturally has singularities because it's got denominators and those denominators can go to zero. The statement of factorization is that on those singularities, what you get are products of subamplitudes. Okay, uh, now what does that mean kind of from, from a technical physical point? Well, it, it says, let's say you have some amplitude A from some theory that satisfies factorization properties. If you multiply by a factor of S and then send S to zero, okay, this is just a fancy way of extracting the pole in one on S. Okay, so here's my diagram for the amplitude. Of course, when S goes to zero, when there's poles, this type of diagram will uh, dominate if there's a one on S type pole. This one on S cancels this S, and then you get a regular function and it factorizes into A left times A right. Now, this is kind of a rather technical assumption, but uh, this is really a very physical statement, okay? This is, this, is, this is a statement that if you take this leg and this leg and you tune their momenta, such that the intermediate leg has S equals to zero. What happens is that this infinity as S goes to zero corresponds to a particle that's actually traveling some great distance in space time, okay? Right, if you even use, um, if you use explicitly, for instance, Schringer time parameterization, you'd see that the infinity from S goes to zero is quite literally uh, 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 the long time uh, part of that propagator, okay? So the statement of factorization is really just a statement that when, when you go to this kinematic limit, you could think of this as a three particle process separated by some traversal of a particle over a great distance followed by a second process. And that's what physically uh, factorization is. 
Now you'll notice in this very first step, I've actually snuck in some assumptions, which are just what we have as input, which is I put an S here, okay? Rather than let's say a minus S or an S to the 15th or some other random function. And that's because we're definitely just assuming something about the free limit of the theory. Right? We're, we're actually really doing perturbation theory. Uh, and that means that uh, uh, we have to assume something about our, our states in the free limit when all couplings are vanishing. Okay, that's a well-defined limit because we're doing perturbation theory. What we're essentially inputting is that the, the wave equation for the uh, external states in the linearized theory is box equals to zero. Okay, I say ghost free uh, here. This just means that there's not a, a, there isn't a minus S here. So it has, if you like a positive kinetic term if you thought of this in terms of a Lagrangian, but uh, a more to the point, you could have imagined higher derivative corrections. Now, this is something that in amplitudes we don't do, but is a certainly perfectly fine thing you could do. So let's say you had a theory, which of course will suffer from uh, many sicknesses of pathology. If you had, let me even write this out. Even if you had, let's say your wave equation wasn't box, but it was box plus box squared over lambda squared and so on equals zero. Okay, so this would happen for instance in higher derivative theories uh, a classic, many classic examples exist, including higher curvature gravity, like stellar gravity, or for instance, uh, Lee Wick theory is another example where you add these types of terms to resolve the hierarchy problem and soften divergences. But the issue is that by adding higher pieces of P squared in the dispersion relation, you get ghosty poles. Okay. Now, from the point of view of a bootstrap, you know, if you kind of didn't care about that, you, you're, you're ultimately just building an analytic function whose factorization channels give one on this object. So there'd be nothing wrong with just technically building a whole perturbation theory around a different type of propagate. <laughs> okay. Now, of course, when you do that, you wouldn't have unitarity guaranteed because in some sense you've introduced ghosty objects. Uh, what is more commonplace, I would say in the amplitudes uh, community is to think of high derivative pieces, like I said here, as an effective field theorist would, okay? which, is, which is as higher dimension operators, which would be included uh, order by order. Okay? So, uh, uh, from, from the point of view of an uh, amplitudes uh, person, anything with extra boxes, as I said in previous lecture, we would eliminate by equations of motion. Something similar happens in gravity. In fact, in, 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 I, I won't even write the equations for this, uh, but I can discuss this offline if, if, if necessary. But when you add higher curvature terms in gravity, very famously, the quadratic terms can actually be eliminated by a field redefinition, modulo the gauss bonnet term, which is actually vanishing in 4D, and in general dimensions doesn't induce uh, uh, ghosts and propagators. Okay, but the, the kind of, the, the point here, the reason I'm kind of unpacking this, uh, one is because there was a question about it, but also just because I want to emphasize that I'm just making assumptions here. Like, yeah, I'm just taking the propagator to be S. Okay, an input of the S matrix bootstrap is the free limit and you can input whatever you like. There are, or I should say, but many amplitudes works or a number of amplitudes works on vial gravity and, and, and various, uh, other things where this would be not box, but box squared. There's a whole variety of things you can do. You just have to know what you assume and make sure you input it consistently. Okay, but the, the upshot here is that when I say factorization, I really mean this technical point that amplitudes factorize. Uh, they factorize on singularities in this way. <clears throat> um, good, and, and, and kind of corollary to that is if AL or AR is zero, okay, like if there just is not a lower point amplitude, then you should expect uh, this quantity be vanishing, which is just another way of saying that A is regular as S goes to zero, right? If S, if A has no poles, then multiplying by S and then sending S to zero just zeroes it out. And that just means that there's no lower point amplitudes, okay? So if those are zero, that's what happens. Okay, good. Um, I think that's all I wanna say about factorization strictly. Uh, occasionally uh, people will use the words factorization and, and mean locality. I'll even do that sometimes. Uh, and and I, I should just uh, emphasize that locality, so factorization means the same thing to everyone everywhere, but in amplitudes, locality is kind of often abused in kind of strict terminology. Uh, when it's stated, people do not mean uh, micro-causality or macro-causality or commuting operators up in, outside the light cone. They don't mean that strict definition. Uh, they mean something kind of much simpler about the space of functions or the types of denominators that appear. Okay, so uh, I'm, I have this little parenthetical here, which is that sometimes a, a weaker assumption of a locality is assumed, where locality here is weaker than factorization. And it's a statement that uh, the pole structure uh, is, is, is uh, sensible and doesn't have overlapping poles. So here's like a, a simple example where you have a 
uh, S12, which is the uh, which is the, the, the uh, P1 plus P2 squared. And here, this is P4 plus P5 squared. So this object is kind of a sensible type of propagator. But when you have overlapping and cross propagators, these are things that are like kind of pure madness. If you tried factorizing them, they give, do very strange things. And that's the sense in which I mean uh, locality would fail. Okay, As you can see, this is a weaker assumption because there's no assumption that on the residue, you get a factorization into two objects. So factorization is a stronger assumption. And depending on the type of bootstrap that someone's doing, you can assume the weaker claim or the stronger claim and still make a fair number of, uh, uh, discover a fair number of things. Sorry, okay. Uh, very naive question. Um, you say uh, box equal to zero. Do you assume that particles are masses throughout the treatment? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, we don't have to. So yeah, uh, thank you for asking that. So of course, if you want to add masses, then I would just replace this with S uh, minus M squared. Okay. Uh, in fact, everything I do in this uh, talk can be upgraded to include masses super trivially. Uh, I can even show you the reference that does it. Um, of course, the conclusions will change. But everything will still apply. Yeah. So, so I, I set. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I should have emphasized here. This is actually. Uh, this is for massless. But in general, we can add anything we want here. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, question. Okay. And uh, yeah. concerning Lawrence invariance, you can still use the same type of representation because uh, will the mass convert the S two two or the D S two two squared in terms of Lawrence uh, uh, invariance? Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't really hear what you said. Can you um, say that again? But you're using uh, functions of the IPJ, and uh, if you introduce a master, this is still uh, concerning the SU2 squared in Lorentz invariance, or is this breaking down to the diagonal? Oh, PA.PJ here is just a Lorentz invariant inner product of the momentum of leg I and leg J. So this would still be a Lorentz invariant. That's totally fine. Uh, of course, if you take pi squared, it won't be zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So may maybe just to, uh, uh, just to clarify, by this I mean pi mu, pj mu. Yeah. So these are all still Lorentz. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, thank you very much for that question. I, in fact, the more questions, the better. I think others, I'm sure, will have similar confusions with my notation and so on. Um, Okay, but let, let me now continue. Okay, so um, okay, so so let's now talk about on-shell kinematics. Okay, so the idea for this talk is I'm going to build a basis of on-shell kinematics in general dimensions. Uh, so in my Tazi lectures, I do d dimension uh, four dimensions. I'm much like what much like uh, Eutine, um, but uh, and also in his in his wonderful book, I'm going to do it in general d just for variety, and so you can see that it, nothing is actually super special. Um, now, in specific, but before I do that, let me just mention that in, of course, specific dimensions like three, four, six, and 10, uh, there exists spinner helicity. It was originally understood in 4D, generalized to six, three, and 10 in various papers. Um, and there's something great about spinner helicity, as, you, as you've seen, which is that it gives a pure kinematic form of the amplitude. And, and what I mean by that is an amplitude where there's no kind of auxiliary polarization, everything is the raw. Uh, you know, angle bracket and square brackets, which they're just the momentum. Okay, so it's sometimes said that, like, you know, you haven't really seen a pure an amplitude in its full gauge invariant form until you've written it in one of these forms where there's no polarizations because there's no uh, gauge symmetry or ward identities. Okay, now that's a luxury of these cases, um, uh, and, and and nothing is as nice as four and three dimensions, I, I think, just in the technical level. But let's say you're just interested in general D, okay, and you're just you're just worried, sorry, you're just worried that you know nothing applies. I want to hear here to convince you that there is an analogous bootstrap that we can deal with. But of course, we have to introduce emu. Okay. Now uh, I need I need a notion of a polarization, or at least it will make this a uh, much more convenient exercise, uh, which of course is something of a retreat from what I said in the first lecture, because I didn't want to introduce the notion of gauge symmetry and so on. Okay. But I want to kind of tell you that this is a kind of a more modest introduction of a redundancy. Okay. When I say I'm introducing AMU, I'm not saying I'm adding AMU to a Lagrangian and introducing the gauge theory and structure constants. I'm really just saying let's build a kinematic function with EMU, a polarization, which represents the dynamics of a massless spin one particle. 
Okay, so if you like, I'm still doing kinematics, but I'm using a variable that's a little bit redundant, which is emu. Okay, so in this notation, uh, pi mu is gonna be the momentum of leg one, ei mu is the polarization of leg one. And for a massless spin one particle, which I'm assuming here, uh, we have pi squared equals p uh, dot equals zero. And I'm also gonna assume that the square is to zero, which I can do for some basis of helicity type states in general dimension. Uh, it's really just a matter of convenience. Yeah. In general dimension, we could find a basis like this. Okay, so uh, the point here is, is the following. I want to build functions out of P and E, okay? And I wanna write them consistent. I wanna make sure they're consistent with my initial assumptions of massless spin one uh, particle, okay? So what I wanna do is first build a minimal kinematic basis. Okay? The idea is really just to build a function of Lorentz invariance. So what are the Lorentz invariants that we can actually make? So there's pi dot pj, there's pi dot ej, and there's ea dot ej, okay? So the idea is first I'm gonna get, essentially get rid of these mu's by just dotting everything into anything you can dot into. Okay, now I put a little subscript here for each of these, which is just telling you the number of basis elements in each of these sets. Okay, so let, let's take for instance, um, uh, 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 th this set here, okay? There's n times n minus one, two uh, objects here, which is just n choose two. It's n choose two because I can pick any i and any distinct j and I can pair them together, okay? If I make i and j equal, then I'm returning to the zero and that isn't part of my basis, okay? So this, this, this uh, constraint here restricts and throws out some of the, the basis elements you'd naively write down. There's no pi squareds, okay? So there's n, oops, there is, um, so there is a, a n choose two of these objects. There's n choose two of these also. And then there's n times n minus one of these because I can pair uh, a pi with anyone except ei. Okay. All right, so that's just me saying that here. Okay, so this is, this is uh, you know, a little more minimal because I've eliminated these pieces, but it's still non-minimal uh, because there's still some redundancy in this basis. Okay, so let me go to that less redundant basis. Okay, the first thing I want to do is just eliminate pn. Okay, by momentum conservation, total momentum conservation. So I, anywhere there's Pn, I just replace it with P1 summed all the way to Pn minus one. <clears throat> okay, now at an operational level, what this means is anywhere you saw Pn dot Pi, I can throw it away and, and drop it from this basis because uh, I can rewrite this Pn as something else and then it's another, it's related linearly to other basis elements. So basically anything of the form Pn dot Pi, I can chuck and that's n minus one objects I can just throw away. Okay, so this n minus one here means n minus one of these guys can drop. Similarly, I, I have pn dot ei, and I can replace pn with this object. And then by dropping these, I can drop another n minus one from the from this set. Okay, so in other words, I've dropped n minus one of one basis and n minus one of another basis. And you might think you're done, but there's actually one more set of subtle constraints which is that pn squared is zero and pn dot en is zero, okay? These were the on-shell constraints for the last leg, okay? We eliminated the nth momentum, but that doesn't mean its momentum, uh, its on-shell condition doesn't still constrain the kinematics. So indeed, if you take pn squared and you replace it with sum of p1 to n minus one and then square it, then you get this expression. And this expression here needs to be vanishing. Similarly, I know that there's this transversality constraint. So this, this quantity here, which is uh, uh, involving all the, all the i's that aren't n is also equal to zero. Okay, so this is, if you like a single equation, linear equation relating the Mandel stems, and this is another linear equation relating the Mandel stems. So this is one constraint. This is one other constraint. Okay, now with each of those one constraints, you can choose to drop or eliminate any one term in the sum or any one term in the sum. So for instance, you could just drop this term from the basis. In other words, you imagine every place this shows up, you use this equation to eliminate this piece. And similarly, anywhere this shows up, you use this equation to eliminate it. Okay. What that does is it lets you eliminate one more basis variable uh, for, for, those, for those respective uh, groups. Okay, so uh, uh, kind of recapping, there's an N minus one that you dropped, another one you dropped, which makes a total of N uh, n, n of the p dot p's that we can throw out. And also there's n of the p dot e's that we can throw out, okay? Now, of, of course, I should emphasize, it's arbitrary kind of what I eliminate, okay? I've eliminated pn. I could eliminate anyone I want. I could eliminate a combination of them. 
I could eliminate this momentum, uh, this invariant, or any other combination. It doesn't matter. The whole point of this bootstrap is you just have to go to a minimal basis and do your exercise, and you'll find the right answer. And of course, you'll be in some uh, coordinatization uh, of your kinematics, but it won't matter in the end. Okay. This is really no different from if you write any amplitude or correlator. I could eliminate P3, P7, P25. It doesn't matter. All those, of course, physically the same expression. This is all we're doing. Okay, good. So um, as I said, we have a bunch of uh, 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 mantle stems that have been eliminated by this procedure. So we've dropped minus, you've dropped N of the P dot P's and we've dropped N of the P dot E's. Okay, so from, from this procedure, we can go from a minimal, a non-minimal kinematic basis to a minimal kinematic basis. Okay, and, and that brings us down to this number of invariants, which is N times N minus three over two and N times N minus two. And it should be clear that the number of e dot E's is the same, okay? No amount of eliminating momenta or whatever is gonna change the fact that the external polarizations are independent, okay? Uh, one thing I should mention, uh, which, which I'm not gonna include as a complication, but you could easily include, is uh, levi chavita uh, type tensor. So if you didn't wanna work in completely arbitrary dimension, abstract dimension D, but you wanted to pick dimension, let's say 26 or 10 or 11, then you just introduce more objects that involve the levi chavita tensor uh, in that dimension. Okay. It just, it complicates things, but it won't change substantively uh, uh, the kind of procedure that I'm going to describe. Okay, good. All right, so, so that is just uh, kinematics. All right, let's do it in some simple examples. Okay, so uh, three particle kinematics. This is by far the simplest case. As I said, uh, uh, the invariants involving E's are just every possible inner product of E, E1, E2, E1, E3, E2, E3, okay? Uh, the number of P dot E's is not, not, not the full exhaustive set because I've eliminated some set, but I've chosen some minimal basis, which is these three, okay? Now, the kind of crucial thing, the most important fact about this, which you, you also encountered before, uh, I think with Eutene, is that there are no p dot p invariants of any kind, a three point, okay? That's simply because, and I even mentioned this last lecture, any invariant of p1, p2, and p3 for three particle kinematics can be rewritten in terms of uh, p1 squared, p2 squared, or p3 squared, okay? I, I should say that if uh, you wanna add masses, which I'm not doing here, but let's say you wanted to, then this would be slightly modified in that pi dot pj is at best a constant, which is the mass squared, okay? which means you can still throw it out. As long as you relabel that constant, which is the mass squared is an arbitrary constant. Okay? Uh, so so uh, you can include masses very straightforwardly as long as you, uh, you know, if you like on this right-hand side of this equation, uh, put an M squared, okay? Okay, good. Um, so so uh, that, that's three particle kinematics. For four particle kinematics, um, for uh, four particle kinematics, um, this is the basis. Again, there's a whole bunch of energies, uh, so a whole bunch of E dot E type terms. There is a whole block of these P's. And then there's two uh, P dot P's, which is just the usual Mandelstam invariance. Here I've eliminated T and I just have S and U. Okay. So this, this kind of uh, discussion up here is meant to be, if you like, the, the generalization of S and T variables for general dimensions. Okay, there's some minimal set, you know, we know that, uh, if you have S, T, and U, it's redundant. You can eliminate one of them. This is just that 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 precise exercise um, uh, for for minimal uh, kinematics. Maybe I can also just say, just to be a little bit more explicit, um, the types of uh, uh, things that this misses. Okay, let me see. Just like a short aside, is things called gram determinants. Gram determinants. Okay, which are basically any kind of epsilon-like relation, which cares about the dimensionality of space. So uh, a simple example would be, uh, for instance, um, let's say I took uh, in four dimensions, P1, mu1, P2, mu2, P3, mu3, P4, mu4, P5, mu5. It took some fully anti-symmetric combination for just arbitrary five vectors. Then this is just a statement that uh, if, you add, if you put enough uh, D vectors in a line, Eventually, you can get a uh, closed relation. Another example, this is the Schouten identity, which you saw uh, 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 previously for 40 kinematics. So this would be like alpha, lambda 2, beta, 
and a three gamma antisymmetry. Okay, so if you contract this with an epsilon alpha beta, then it gives you the shot measurement. So th there's a general set of objects which are kind of clearly connected to uh, levi chavita type contractions, uh, which would, if you like, give relations amongst the bases I'm showing here. So in, 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 in specific dimensions, the things inside these curly brackets are not completely general, they have relations amongst them. Okay. But that's the only real subtlety you have to care about when you go to higher uh, when you go to a specific dimension, which I'm not gonna do uh, really for, the, for, for this discussion. Okay, so, so with this said, now let's actually start bootstrapping. Okay. And, and what we're gonna do is the following. So the plan is uh, I'm gonna start first with, um, the scalar bootstrap. So I'm just going to take scalar particles. If you like all these epsilons, I'm just going to throw them away and just study scalars, bootstrap it at, at kind of the lowest orders. Then we'll move on to vectors and then uh, tensors, which is to say gravity, and then higher spin. Um, now, uh, what's the upshot here? So the upshot here is that uh, at no point am I going to assume the usual, you know, structure. Like I'm not going to assume Yang Mills theory, Lagrangian. I'm not going to assume that there is a Lie algebra with the structure constant. You know, this kind of rich, uh, uh, well, cer certainly illuminating structure of gauge symmetry and, ge and geometrical understanding of gauge symmetry. None of that's going to be input. The idea here is that we're going to try to build everything we know about Q of T purely from this kinematic set of statements. Okay. And we're going to start a three point and learn some already basic facts. Okay. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, feel, feel free again to, uh, to chime in. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we'll start first with the scalar bootstrap. Okay. Uh, for the scalar bootstrap, as I said, all the epsilons are, are zero, okay? and we're going to start at three point. So we're going to start for three point scalar. For three point, recall, uh, you know, this, these are all gone. Okay, that just, I mean, everything's gone because there's no epsilons in a scalar theory. So what you're left with, since p is zero, is just a is a constant, which is lambda, which is just the amplitude for a phi cubed potential. Okay, um, that is the only scalar three point amplitude. There are no others, okay? Here I've, I've called this lambda, uh, uh, just to parameterize that constant. There is no kinematically dependent three particle scattering amplitude involving scalars. Now, naively that should sound strange if you know how to use a Lagrangian because you could write lots of naively, perfectly reasonable theories with higher derivatives, that is to say momenta, uh, um, uh, in, in, in a phi cube type interaction, okay? So, so let's be very explicit. Let's imagine that you had a theory with, in fact, um, let, let me back up slightly. Uh, I didn't stipulate any properties of the scalar at all. So in fact, you can imagine this is three separate distinct scalars, okay? like phi one, phi two, phi three, and there's literally no invariant. So uh, the statement is not just that like a, a boson with no flavor doesn't have any interaction other than phi cubed. The statement is there is no interaction for any number of scalars interacting except a potential term, <laughs> okay? And, and let's unpack why that's not contradictory from what we know. Okay? So here I'm just writing a Lagrangian that is a kinetic term for three scalars and just plainly a derivatively coupled term with a phi, phi one, phi two, and phi three, okay? These are just different flavors that I've, I've invented. Okay, here K is a coupling constant. Okay, now um, this theory is not, it's not trivial in the sense that it's not a free theory like the one we saw uh, last lecture, but it is trivial at three point, okay? And you can see this in two ways, okay? Now, um, okay, let me start, maybe start with the, the second way is what I just really described, which is the amplitude is trivial, okay? You just compute it even for this, you get P1 dot P2. P1 dot P2 is zero because it's the same as uh, P3 squared, since I've assumed it's massless. Um, again, even if you added a mass uh, for, for say P3, what you get is still not uh, a momentum dependent, it would just be a mass squared, which is still a constant. Okay? So the, the general claim is true, even for masses. Now you could ask, well, okay, that's fine and good in amplitudes, but what does this mean in terms of Lagrangian? Well, it harkens back to what I said about field redefinitions um, uh, earlier in, in, my, in my previous lecture, uh, which, you can, which you can see in the following way. Okay, So just take this operator and just rewrite it by integration by parts. Okay, So you can just like, uh, write this p uh, d derivative of phi one derivative of phi two as box acting on the composite phi one phi two and then subtract the diagonal terms and that lets you have keep the cross term. Okay. So in other words, this is a way of writing this so that everything has a box. Right. This term has box of phi one 
This term is box of phi two. This term is box of phi three. Okay. So if you like, this is a this is an this is a vertex where every single term has a box. Uh, now, um, from last time, we saw that when you have things proportional to the box in a theory like this, I can find clever field way definitions that eliminate them. Okay. And at least at this low order, which is this first cubic order, I can write down an explicit field way definition that just entirely cancels this term. Okay. Uh, uh, it'll be a, it'll be a field way definition where phi one, phi two, or phi three shift by themselves plus a phi squared type term. Okay. The idea is that when you do that and you, you add some nonlinearity here, you'll get a, a cubic term from the kinetic term, which can then be used to cancel this piece. Okay. So in other words, there exists a field basis where this term has been eliminated altogether. Okay. Now you might say, wait, it's gone. I have a free theory, how is that possible? Well, the point is it's not a free theory because you can eliminate the cubic term, but in doing so you generate quadratic uh, quartic terms because you have five squared pieces from here and five squared pieces from here. Okay. So the statement is not that this is a trivial theory. The statement is that all the dynamics of this three point coupling can be upgrade, like can be kind of kicked up to four point. Okay, so this is secretly a theory that where all the dynamics is happening at four point. I just happened to write it in a bad way where it looks like it's a three, three particle cubic type theory. Yeah, but you can see this all super explicitly uh, by just doing the field redefinition. I'm not going to do it here, but I welcome you to just try as an exercise, build the field redefinition that just eliminates this. Okay, once you do that, you've proven to yourself that there is a basis where this term is gone, where there's only four point, and thus you can prove that, that the three point function is zero just by doing the field redefinition. Okay. So I'm kind of, I'm switching gears here between amplitudes and QFT, but I'm trying to demystify that there's no magic. We're just kind of seeing the exact same physics in a second, in a second way. Okay. okay, good. So there's not, there's nothing confusing about this, although it's odd to say there's no cubic scalar theory other than a potential, but it is a true fact of, of nature. Okay, good. Um, uh, any questions about in that? Um, you can chime in if, if, if you have any questions. Um, good. Uh, now let's keep let's keep going. Okay. So let's move on to four point scalar. Okay. Now for four point scalar, uh, th there's kind of a natural uh, 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 classification of the kinds of things I can build an amplitude out of, and they're very natural from the point of view of Feynman diagrams if you think about it that way. Which is there's contact vertices, and then there's like factorization pieces. So by contact vertex, all I mean is an amplitude which is a local function of p, which means no p's in the downstairs. Okay, so uh, maybe local is, I shouldn't use this word because it may confuse you. I just mean a, a function of, of p, a polynomial in p, uh, not a rational function of p, which would have p's in the downstairs. I just mean a polynomial uh, uh, of positive powers in p. Okay, so for the moment, we can just consider a series that have contact vertices. Okay, now if you do that, you can just enumerate all possible functions you could build out of s, t, and u, okay? Of course, we know secretly there's only s and u or s and t, whichever way you want to parameterize it. But uh, for this particular uh, scalar case, uh, it'll be convenient to, um, to, uh, 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 to, to, to use s, t, and u. Uh, let me for the moment highlight that I'm actually going to be doing single flavor, let's say just for the moment for this particular slide, okay? For a single scalar, if you just have a, a phi four coupling, uh, sorry, I, I shouldn't say it this way. I don't know what the Lagrangian is, okay? So instead I should say this as, what are the amplitudes that have no powers of P in them? Okay, the only answer is constant, okay? And the idea is that you now have deduced that this is the amplitude for phi to the four. You've learned about phi to the four from the bootstrap. Okay, and now you just keep ratcheting up, you know, the types of momentum behavior that can exist. So now you go up one and you say, what about all four point amplitudes that have P squared in them? Okay. All functions of two function to two powers of momenta. There's only S plus T plus U. This is the only uh, uh, permutation invariant combination of momenta. Um, and this is zero. <clears throat> okay. Which uh, tells you that uh, uh, this theory, which was D phi squared phi squared has vanishing amplitude. Okay. And indeed we already saw this. This was that kind of weird, perverse free theory I wrote that had a huge tower of higher derivative uh, interactions, confusingly, but had all vanishing scattering amplitudes. This is precisely that. And this we're just learning 
is a simple byproduct of two facts, Bose symmetry and kinematics, which says that the sum is zero. Okay, now let me just say as a, as a, as a caveat here, okay? If you had multiple flavors, okay, let's say multiple flavors, okay, the conclusion changes. Why do I say that? Okay, so if there's multiple flavors, for instance, let me write more suggestively something like D pi, D pi, pi pi, okay? But I have flavor indices, I, J, K, L, okay? And some lambda I, J, K, L here, okay? So now there's multiple fields, I'm calling them pi for a very, maybe hopefully obvious reason that the chiral Lagrangian, the nonlinear sigma model that describes pions in the chiral limit is exactly of this form. Two to two pion scattering is not zero, okay? So there's gotta be a loophole in this argument because it seems like I'm claiming it's zero. Well, the loophole is Bose symmetry in the sense that of the following sense. So when I say that this is the only object, oops, when I say this is the only object I can write down, that's Bose invariant, that's if I have no flavor index, okay? But if I also have a flavor structure, lambda IJKL, then when I permute, let's say leg one and leg two, then I should swap P1 and P2, which will scramble around these momenta, but it also scrambles around the lambdas, okay? Which allows me to write objects which are permutation invariant, which are not S plus T plus U, okay? So in fact, you could write something like, uh, I'm sorry, it's a little cramped here, but you could write something like S plus T, T S plus T times lambda I J K L, some tensor like this, plus all permutations. Okay. And this is exactly the kind of loophole that the nonlinear sigma model lives on. Okay. And that's why for the NLSM, this is not zero. This is a this is a this is a, a non a non-vanishing amplitude. Okay. Now I'm gonna talk actually maybe next lecture about bootstrapping that. Okay, from other principles that I'm gonna have to add on top of this. But the upshot here is that it really matters what you assume. This is gonna tell you exactly what physics, uh, this is gonna agree with all known physics, of course, because it's a consistent setup. Uh, now we can keep going. We can look at uh, P to the fourth, which would, uh, again, for a, a flavorless single boson, just gives you S squared plus T squared plus U squared. And this gives you the D phi to the four action for a uh, U1 Goldson boson. Okay, so this shows up all over the place. Any Goldson boson with a shift symmetry, this is the leading interaction for it if it's uh, abelian. <clears throat> And then you can just keep building on and on and on, okay? At the next higher order, if you had decided to add uh, six powers momenta, you get S cubed plus T cubed plus U cubed, which is also equal to S to U, uh, given, given the uh, fact that S, T, and U are not independent. And just on very general grounds, A4 is this function of these two functions, this uh, a quadratic function of Mandel stems and this cubic function of Mandel stems. So basically the entire space of Bose invariant single flavor scalar theories is just the space of functions. Okay, this is the space of all scalar four point amplitudes that are single flavor. <clears throat> okay, good. Um, now, now this is a giant space. You might still wonder, you know, what picks out the vast, you know, class of theories in here? What makes the NLSM special rather than just some theory with a range of random couplings here. And I'm gonna talk about that next lecture. But for the moment, given our assumptions of Lorentz invariant locality, this is it. Okay. Now, what I have not at all input is contact. Uh, uh, sorry, what I have not input is factorization. Okay? All these things are contact vertices, which uh, in a very precise sense implies that this is true. Okay? When I say contact vertex, I mean that A4 is a polynomial in P, which means it has no poles. Since it has no poles, if I multiply by S and send S to zero, I get zero. Because there's no one on S and there's no one on S here to ever cancel that S to give a finite number, okay? This is always going to be zero if A4 is regular with S, okay? So if you like, all these things have no factorization channels, okay? Another way of, yeah, so all, all that means is if you try to build three point from them, you'll get zero, okay? There's no three point function that you get from, from going to singular kinematics of any of these objects because they have no poles. Now, that is, that is an omission because we know that there should be some theory that, or some amplitude which, that knows about three point. So we have to include that as another type of object we can add, which is a factorization piece. Okay? So if A3 is not equal to zero, we can consider a different class of A4s. Okay? So if you like, forget this class of uh, contacts for now, let's consider an abstract A4. I should probably write uh, this as, let's say, factorization. Okay? And 
uh, its property is that on this uh, on this poll, it should give A3, A3, which as we said up here, uh, if you decided to have this as your theory, if lambda is not equal to zero, then uh, you precisely have lambda squared. Okay. And that uniquely fixes this expression. A4 is this lambda squared times one over S, one on T, one on U. Okay, now uh, uh, you, can, you can do this type of uh, procedure in a very abstract way, okay? Uh, you, you might, you, it almost might look like I've just like kind of write, written down the obvious answer because it's the only thing it can be. But here's what you can do that's more, more precise uh, and more general. For A4, you could just write a completely general function with a numerator and denominator. You could just put a soup of stuff in the upstairs and the downstairs and just demand that this constraint is true and then it equals this. And when you do that, you're going to get this as the answer. Okay. I'm not going to do that here because it's just a bit tedious, but you can literally put for F4 factorization just a rational function, a rational function of momenta, uh, and then and then and then check that this uh, constraint is true. Okay, um, uh, let me mention one more thing before moving on to a higher spin. Uh, this approach makes that vanishing S matrix statement from before actually very easy to see. Recall that again, that weird free theory I wrote, which was d phi lambda phi, where lambda was this uh, 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 tower of, of couplings. As I said, all the amplitudes vanish. Let's just prove that without actually doing a calculation, or at least not a difficult calculation, okay? So of course, if I asked you to compute this at 28 point, it'd be a lot of work. You know, you'd have to compute tons of diagrams with lots of factorization pieces. And only after you added every single diagram with all the right factors, and, and accounted for every topology, would you get zero for all amplitudes? Okay, but we're gonna show how with the power of S matrix reasoning, it's much easier to see. Okay, so, and we're gonna use essentially factorization. So uh, first of all, let me start with a baseline induction case of just the three point amplitude. This is zero by direct computation. Okay, I've shown this to you now like three times. Okay. So this is, this is us establishing that the three point amplitude is vanishing. Now, if you want to compute the four point, you could use Feynman rules and do that. But here, here's, a, here's a, a, a kind of slicker way. We know that A4 has no poles. Okay, why do I, why do I know that A4 has no poles? Well, uh, I know for the following reason. Uh, this factorization condition, uh, let, me, let me move up uh, to uh, all the way back up to here. Um, yeah, so this factorization condition says that uh, on the S pole, I get A left times A right. So if I take a four point function and I go to S goes to zero, I should get a product of lower point. That means A3 times A3. That would be A3 times A3, okay? Now A3 is zero, okay? Since A3 is zero in this setup, <clears throat> sorry, since A3 is zero in this setup, it means that A4 has no poles, okay? So in other words, factorization tells us that A4 has no poles, which means it's a regular function of momentum. Now it's a regular function of momenta that has p squared, it goes as p squared, and it has to be Bose invariant and permutation invariant. There's only one function that does that, which is the sum over pi dot pj summed on all ij. Okay, so if you like, we're just like reasoning that a4 has to be this, because this is the only function that exists that has no poles and goes as p squared. And this thing is zero just by kinematics. Okay, so this establishes that a4 is also zero in shell. Now you know that A4 is zero and A3 is zero, and then you keep going, A5, A6, and so on. Okay, so this is the power of factorization. It lets you apply inductive type arguments to prove all order statements, okay? So basically I'm just telling you that if you can show that the endpoint, uh, uh, endpoint that, that all endpoint local functions that go as P squared are zero, which is easy to show, then you've proven that this is a free theory at all orders, at all orders in N. Okay. At some point, someone had asked a very good question, which was, if you can only check to some low point, how do you know if things are equal? It's this type of logic, powerful logic that extends to any endpoint inductively. Okay, good. Uh, let me, let me uh, uh, keep going, march forward. Uh, let's move on to the vector bootstrap. Okay. Every, obviously, everything we set up here is very simple, but it, I wanted to kind of really go through it mechanically to illustrate that nothing is magical. Everything you find in the end is the space of theories you should expect, given what we know about uh, field basis redundancy. Okay, now let's go to the vector bootstrap. Exactly the same procedure. The idea here though, is that vectors are multilinear polarizations. Okay, so in other, in other words, I wanna write down an actual on now. Okay, 
uh, maybe just to remind you, that's an ansatz that's made of these objects. You just build a function out of these invariants. The only constraint is that it has to be linear in E1, linear in E2, and linear in E3. Okay, that's the only constraint. Uh, you do that and you find um, there's just one ansatz. Okay, this is it. Uh, if you assume lowest order in P, first order in P, Okay, let me, let me unpack that slightly, okay? We want something which is linear in E1, E2, and E3, okay? Now there's three vectors there, so I need at least one momentum just to make a Lorentz invariant, okay? So I know there's at least one factor of P just to write a Lorentz invariant object, okay? Now the idea is let me assume the lowest order in P. Okay, I'm just gonna build whatever I get from this, okay? Now um, this C1, C2, and C3 are just free coefficients, which I'm now gonna fix. Now, what, what is the constraint? Well, as I said, since I'm working in general D, I have to suffer through the fact that E1, E2, E3 are actually, these guys are redundant. They are still redundant. And I have to input the fact that their unphysical polarizations need to decouple from physical amplitudes, okay? Now, this is of course, nothing other than the word identity, okay? Usually we think of this as a byproduct of all the, uh, 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 you know, machinery of Q of T at the end. But of course, this is really just saying that the polarizations I define to label my external kinematics uh, have, have, are redundant, indeed redundant up to shifting by P1, okay? So they're transverse, okay, in that case. Now, uh, if I fix these as my constraints, I'm really just a, a basically building a bootstrap based on the word identity. You get three constraints, one, two, and three, which then fix this is zero, this is zero, and this is zero which then fixes this solution, which very much unsurprisingly is this, okay? Which is precisely the Yang Mills on shell 3.0 amplitude, modulo one crucial uh, element, which is color, okay? So, so, but if I just looked at this from a kinematic point of view, you'd be like, okay, this is, this is it, this is the answer, okay? Now, why do you learn about color in this way? I'm really just gonna be repeating something you saw for 4D. If you look at, you know, if you imagine this was a theory of a single vector with no internal index, you realize that this is anti-symmetric under exchanging one and two. Okay, the fact this is P1 minus P2 means that if you swap P1 and P2 and E1 and E2, you get a minus sign. Okay. By Bose symmetry from spin statistics, uh, 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 we, we, we know that this vector spin one particle needs to be a boson, which means it should not be anti-symmetric. If you wanna uh, go into why we even know spin statistics is true, it's actually uh, a byproduct of coupling to gravity, which I think you team may even cover. I might consider going through the next lecture, but if you like with higher order understanding, which is to say coupling of these objects to spin two, you can learn even more. But for the moment, let me just assume a spin statistics, spin statistics as an input. Then this is actually an inconsistent answer, okay? Uh, if you like, if I just wrote down a vector, a single vector, and it had to be anti-symmetric, then this has to be zero. In other words, there is no anti-symmetric boson uh, that exists. Now, the loophole uh, that you, I think, have already seen is that uh, you can introduce a structure constant. So if you don't have a single vector, but a multiplet of vectors who are labeled by A, B, and C, then, uh, and I have even called it color, it's just an internal index, then provided F, A, B, C is anti-symmetric, then all of a sudden the full object is both symmetric, okay? Because this is anti-symmetric and this is anti-symmetric, so two together give you a symmetric object. And this is yang Mills. okay? So this is precisely the way in which the structure constant is not input into the theory as an assumption, it's an output. The only consistent function you could write down was anti-symmetric, so you, in order to not have zero, you had to introduce an anti-symmetric structure constant, fully anti-symmetric and cyclic, okay? Um, <clears throat> good. Um, now. Uh, we can we can now continue this procedure. Okay? We can continue this procedure by adding higher powers of p. Okay? So here we had three epsilons and one p, and that gave us Yang Mills. You might ask, what about three epsilons and two p's? Well, that's no there's no Lorentz invariant because there's as you can see an odd number of Lorentz indices, so you can't contract them. So this does not exist. If you had three p's, okay. That is to say three derivatives and three polarizations, you learn that this is actually the amplitude for F cube theory. Okay, and by F cube theory, I mean, if you take uh, uh, the, the gluon field strength and you cube it, you add that dimension six operator, 
This is something which appears in SMEFT. It's one of the 58 higher dimension operators in, in, in the SMEFT basis. This object, uh, th this object uh, F cubed, its amplitude is precisely uh, this object. Okay, it's built from linearized field strengths at this order, where this is just an anti-symmetric combination of P, 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 and E, and you just contract field strength one, field strength two, and field strength three. Okay, it's obvious how that comes from this, hopefully. And again, you have an anti-symmetric structure constant. Okay, so so the upshot here is that if you like, this is how you, this is how amplitudes learns about effective field theory, or at least power counting in effective field theory. In, in amplitudes, effective field theory is just adding more powers of P and seeing what consistent objects arise. The fact that Yang-Mills is very stringently constrained, the renormalizable Yang-Mills theory is the fact that there was one solution here. Uh, there is one solution here, but as you can imagine, if you add ever higher powers of P and higher point, you'll get more and more solutions in general, okay? Which is why EFTs get more and more coupling constants. You can think of that as just the amplitudes they correspond to have more invariants you can build, which are consistent with Lorentz invariants and these uh, statements of the word entity. Okay, um, uh, uh, one minor, yeah, let, let, me, let me briskly keep going because I'm running a little behind. Uh, uh, let me let me push forward to four point, okay? Because I do want to get to the higher spin case. Uh, I apologize if I go maybe maybe ten minutes late today, like last time. Um, now for a four point vector, we can do exactly the same thing we did for for, for scalars. Okay, I write contact vertices. Contact vertices are things where there's no momentum in the downstairs. I need it to be multilinear in epsilon, and I want there to be the same dimensional counting. As the amplitudes I got, as the ones that are consistent with the gauge coupling that I would have inferred here. Okay, so in other words, there's some number of uh, uh, momenta that show up here. Uh, that's consistent with, um, sorry, that's consistent with uh, no momenta in the four-point contact term. So this is my onset d onset d1 d2 d3. Okay, so uh, I'll go through this a little bit quickly again because I'm running out of time. But the idea here is that uh, we can take the three-point amplitude. We saw, and if you like, we've discovered what the Yang-Mills vertex is. Okay, so if, if you like, this is almost like doing a matching calculation in an EFT. Someone bootstrapped the EFT. Uh, someone bootstrapped the amplitude. You can match it to a vertex, and then fold it in to an amplitude, and then use that to to, to determine the properties of higher point vertices. Here, this a mu nu rho sigma is just literally what we call the Yang-Mills three-point vertex, where I've stripped off the polarizations in F. And to build the factorization piece, I just, I'm just building the Feynman diagram. That's all this is, okay? Now, of course, the logic behind it is that this is, the unique, this is an object which factorizes properly onto three point because it's built from a three point and another three point. I have chosen the Lorentz gauge propagator here, but any difference uh, uh, of this thing from the spin sum will vanish on the cut. The point here is that this is a choice where if I send P1 plus P2 squared to zero, this thing will factorize properly. There's more than one choice you can make here, but I'm making a convenient one. Okay. Now, of course, this this uh, 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 I need to add T and U here, but the total object here I get is F factorization. And what in the end I have is a contact term is a factorization term. And as, as it, you can plainly see, all I'm doing is solving for what the Yang-Mills quartic needs to be given the Yang-Mills cubic, okay? Of course, we determine the Yang-Mills cubic from first principles, okay? And now we're feeding it in and then determining what four point has to be. Now, I, I kind of welcome you to do this exercise yourself, but if you now take this object and, and just apply this ward identity bootstrap uh, to this function, okay, uh, and you go to minimal kinematics, it's very important you go to minimal basis of kinematics, so you're working on shell, then you find that in fact, this places a constraint on the structure constants. Uh, in other words, if you assume these Fs have absolutely no properties other than that they are anti-symmetric, you will in general not ever be able to satisfy these set of equations. You can only satisfy these equations if the Jacobi identity is satisfied. Okay, so if you like, these set of equations imply the Jacobi identity, which is again, not an input, but an output. Okay, I'm not assuming a Lie algebra, I'm not assuming gauge symmetry, I'm just throwing in flavor structures which are secretly color structures and learning that this identity has to be true. At the same time, D1, D2, D3 are fixed precisely to the Yang-Mills uh, uh, coefficients. Uh, 
uh, to give precisely the angles amplitude. Okay, I'm not going to go through the details of that, but it's a it's a relatively simple exercise where you just add this to this and solve for these given the ward identity constraint. So if anything, it's a statement that the ward identities are not just a check of consistency, they're sufficiently constraining to define this theory. Okay, good. Um, excellent. So uh, what have we done here for, for, for Yang Mills? I haven't said anything about masses, but uh, uh, you can kind of see that if you include masses, uh, something similar can happen except PI squared is, is not, not zero. Let me move on to higher spin. Okay, which will be actually very simple to do given what I've done. Okay, for a higher spin bootstrap. Okay, so this is the analog of going to arbitrarily high spin in 4D, which you, which you team did. I'm going to represent an arbitrary higher spin particle with a symmetric traceless polarization tensor epsilon, which dotted into P is zero, so it's transverse and which is traceless. Okay. Now, uh, something we often do in amplitudes without loss of generalization is to think of this. Um, just to think of this epsilon uh, tensor as, an, uh, as a tensor product of vectors. Okay, now of, of course, any symmetric product like this, I can think of as a sum of objects like this. So I'm really just gonna consider each of terms in that sum, and it'll be much easier to think of this as kind of a, a, a multiple product of, 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 of single vectors rather than this full tensor, okay? Uh, and this is the way that everyone in amplitude thinks about gravity flux. So in gravity, you would normally have a tensor, which is a symmetric two index object, but instead we think of it as a, a product of two vector uh, polarizations. Okay, so let's really just do the three point tensor, okay? Which is by this, I just mean, ultimately we're gonna learn it's gravity, of course, but the idea is we just write another ansatz. Okay, I'm not gonna write down all the terms or six terms in total, but it's an ansatz that has to be quadratic in E1, quadratic in E2 and quadratic in E3. Okay, because it's a bivector in E1, E2, and E3. And then we just write down every possible invariant we can have. Okay, so this again is an ansatz where the Cs are unfixed. And uh, again, I'm not, I'm not gonna go through because it's such a simple exercise, but imposing this constraint, you get that this is equal to GR. Okay, uh, one thing I should tell you, uh, if, if, especially for those who actually wanna get their hands dirty and do this operation, when you impose these constraints, it's super crucial that after you after you apply E1 goes to P1, E2 goes to P3, that you go back to the minimal basis of kinematics, right? Because in general, if you send E2 to P2 and E3 to P3 and E1 to P1, you'll leave the minimal kinematic basis, but we know how to go back to the original basis because of all those relations amongst uh, the things outside the basis, okay? So it's crucial to do this check in a minimal basis. Otherwise, you're not doing on-shell amplitudes. You're doing off-shell amplitudes. Okay? And, and you'll only get consistent things if you study these physical on-shell amplitudes. Okay, so the upshot here, uh, again, I'm not gonna show it, but you can take my word for it and check yourself. It's very simple to check, is that you get gravity. You get Einstein's general relativity, the extremely complicated three-point function, uh, naively of, of, of three gravitons interacting. You just get from this constraint for E1, E2, and E3. Now, at this point, I'll note a very remarkable fact, um, uh, which which I, ha I haven't shown you here, but but if you, if you work this out, you can see yourself, which is that the, GR three-point function and I showed here is literally the square of the Yang Mills three-point function. Okay, so this, this function I, I wrote up here, this function here, this kinematic function, if you literally square it, you get the graviton amplitude. Okay. This is the very first sign of remarkable structure and simplicity. The first of which uh, uh, I'll mention, which is the double copy, which is a statement that you can take gauge theory objects, amplitudes, and literally square them to get gravity, okay? Uh, this operation transcends three points. It works at any number of particles. It has been used in a numeral number of applications, which I'll des describe briefly or, or maybe in depth, depending on, on what I decide, uh, which include um, super gravity calculations and more recently uh, applications to LIGO and gravitational wave physics, where basically we use QCD amplitudes to compute the uh, amplitudes relevant for black hole scattering, okay, in a very explicit way. Um, but the idea is that this is not only a practical tool, but suggests some very remarkable underlying connection between two parts of the standard model. Einstein's relativity contains two copies of the strong interactions in it, okay? And this is a weak, weak mapping. This is not like ADS-CFT, this is much more odd, 
Okay, good. Uh, in the last maybe five minutes here, let me now just uh, jump to even higher spin. Okay, you can you can of course go to four point tensor and so on, and you build all of general relativity. I'm not going to do that here, but I'll leave that as an exercise to you. It's the same mechanics I showed you for four point scalar and four point Yang mills. Let's say you want to go to ever higher spin. Okay, for ever higher spin, there's actually a very nice uh, basis you can use, which is if you like already Ward identity satisfying, okay? and that's the basis of objects we already constructed. So if you think about it, this Yang-Mills kinematic factor satisfies Ward identities by construction. This F cubed object also satisfied the Ward identities by construction. There are actually other objects which satisfy uh, the Ward identity by construction. Oh, sorry, let me have a typo here. This is epsilon three. Um, uh, those objects are basically the amplitudes for a scalar coupled to uh, a, a, a scalar coupled to a gauge boson. So here leg three is the gauge boson and, and legs one and two is a scalar. So this is, if you like, a scalar QCD. Okay, so all these objects here are natural, you know, gauge invariants, which I mean things that satisfy the Ward entity. So they're natural building blocks to make other gauge invariant objects. Now for spin two, what you can literally do is just take an ansatz built from these. Okay, if you like, it's a shortcut. I've already established the kind of minimal units, uh, sorry, the minimal units of objects, which are invariant at three point, which are this thing, which is Yang Mills, and this thing, which is F cubed. So we can just put them together to make more invariants. And by put them together, I don't mean add them. I mean, multiply them. And that's what's the kind of interesting fact here, right? Of course, if I just took this and I added it to this, I would have the amplitude of a Yang Mills theory plus F cubed. But you can do something much more exotic, which is multiply them. Okay, for instance, you could take Yang Mills and just square it. That gave us exactly gravity, as I said a second ago. Alternatively, you can take the F cubed uh, amplitude, which I just took, and just square it. And you get an amplitude, which by construction is invariant because it's uh, built from the square of an invariant. And this turns out to be the amplitude for R cubed, Riemann cubed. If you take cross terms like Yang Mills, uh, vertex times F cubed, you get the amplitude for uh, gauss binet which in 4D is zero, which is why Eugene doesn't see it in 4D, but in general dimensions is present and matters. Okay. So uh, the, the, the upshot here, uh, and this is really where, where I'll end at least this lecture, is that if you want to build spin greater than two, you just build ever higher objects built from these. Okay, I should have, I should have cited this, but there's a, a really excellent uh, set of papers by uh, Kurt Hinterbickler, Rachel Rosen and other collaborators where they go through this bootstrap, including not only higher spin, but also masses. So they look at massive higher spin with masses higher spin and do the full bootstrap. And they write basically the full space of solutions, um, which of course agree with all the gauge invariant things we see, but also can tell us things about say massive gravity or massive higher spin. Uh, now, now maybe the one last thing I'll mention is that Perhaps the most constraining feature of all these uh, on all these higher spin uh, uh, theories is that ultimately you want to consider higher spin couplings to gravity, okay? Where you have a higher spin particle and then there's a graviton that couples to it. Okay? So if you like, it's higher spin, higher spin gravity, and those are very constraining. And that, in fact, is what is is is, uh, is ultimately what kills, as as Eugene is describing and will describe. Uh, kills a vast majority of massless higher spin theories, which is that they have no coupling to a stress tensor, which is to say they can't couple to gravity. Okay, good. Uh, that is all I want to say about this kind of basic bootstrap. Uh, next time, I'm going to talk about how to do more sophisticated things with scalars, uh, having to do with uh, infrared structure. And then I'll even talk about uh, initiate a discussion of this double copy structure uh, where, where really the upshot of the next set of lectures is going to be structure, okay? So right now I've really just, you know, admittedly been rehashing things you know, but in an exotic way. But this thing is not a thing you know. You don't know how to do this at a Lagrangian level. I'm going to talk about unpacking things like this and other uh, related features uh, and, and kind of the new structures we can learn uh, fr fr from this procedure. Now let me stop there and, and take questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Any questions from the board at all? Oh, uh...
I have no question. So you mentioned that D3 and 4 and 6 and 10 or something, we can uh, construct the average by uh, pure kinematics. So I think at least, uh, uh, is there any, uh, uh, can we understand uh, uh, in simple way or intuitively why that uh, in that dimension we can uh, understand uh, the construct there? Uh, right is there i think the question is is there a simple understanding of why in certain dimensions you can kind of work in this polarization free picture where everything oh you think someone raised my hand uh, uh where there's a polarization free picture what's the limits test for when you can do that and i i think um the kind of imprecise answer to that is if you can write down the least redundant possible variables for your kinematics, then you'll be closer to be removing the notion of polarization. Now that said, hopefully you saw from Eugene's lectures that even if you used 4D spin of helicity, if you introduce polarization tensors that have references, you'll have references in intermediate stages of the calculation and only in the very end will they cancel. Okay, now kind of very secretly, that is uh, the same, uh, you know, epsilon goes to epsilon plus p redundancy that we're talking about here. And you can make it go away in the end. <clears throat> but there exist other formulations where you build amplitudes and there's these references and you have to do a lot of work to get rid of them. So it's not always the case that working in fixed dimension kind of cleans you of any uh, reference or gauge dependence. It can sometimes sneak in in very funny ways. But you know, maybe, maybe the 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 uh, there's not like a super mathematically precise litmus test. Like that's why it happens here and not other places. But I think the basic point is that in 4D spinnerlicity, those variables are very non-redundant. <laughs> They're just like you know, when you when, when in, in general dimension when you generate an e mu, which is the d vector, for a very few number of degrees of freedom, it's like vastly overkill, and it's that fact that you have to do that. If you're in a specific number of dimensions and you can introduce spinners or bi spinners of some type that just reduce the redundancy, then you're in better shape. Um, so at least that's my intuition, which is that like the intrinsic redundancy of your variables is lower. But if anything, I wanted to convey here is that you know the amplitudes won't look as nice in general D, but the general procedure of just understanding the space of theories is identical and in some sense more general because it's in general D. If you want to know what types of massless, massive spin interactions could ever exist even in principle, you just apply this bootstrap. Uh, so it still gives you the information about what theories allow, which is in my view, one of the interesting things. You're not gonna stare at the expressions and find some beautiful Park Taylor form. You'll find other structures in other ways, uh, but, but you can still, I think, learn about the theory. Thank you for the nice lecture. Uh, I have a question on the post free condition uh, for the limit of small uh, uh, S uh, multiplied by the four point uh, interaction. You, you said how important it is to impose this uh, single, single pole limit. Uh, in the low energy, right? It's the low energy limit. You are, uh, I think, the factorized. Uh, in, you are looking at the factorized part of the four point interaction, right? The right. factorization. You are assuming the factorization and then um, uh, this S channel propagate or whatever other channels is dominated by single points. Then, uh, because uh, I think the according to the lecture from yesterday, I think. It, you can one. He commented on this single pole uh, dominance, excluding the higher spin uh, possibility. So, can you comment on that? I mean, the in principle, you can continue to go on, including uh, higher spin uh, interaction. Right. So, so I, I have to go back to see. I have to go back to see precisely what part of the lecture you, you mean, because uh, I, I haven't seen all of it. But I would say that, I mean, the input of the simple poll is 
just straight up an assumption. It's an input, which is that the free propagation is given by box. If you wanted to make a theory that had ghosts and you weren't worried about ghosts for whatever reason, <laughs> uh, but wanted to build an analytic function, which had ghost propagators, just the same procedure of that bootstrap would apply. Now, of course, once you build those amplitudes and you study them on factorization poles and ask about positivity of the spectral density on the cut, then you'll find all kinds of sicknesses because you'll have negative ghost poles. But if you like, what I want to say is that, you know, it's different strokes for different folks. If you don't want any ghosts and you want simple poles because your propagator's box at leading order perturbation theory, then use that. If you want your propagator to be box of the fourth, uh, box squared, you know, I would say buyer beware. I would say there's no guarantee of anything, but you could still bootstrap amplitudes in vial gravity that way. You could still do it. So just that principle still applies. Um, so I, I would just say it's uh, an input. Depending on what you have decided your asymptotic states are, you can make different choices. From the point of view of EFT, usually when we see these higher derivative kinetic term pieces, we would think of them as not... Uh, there's kind of a, there's like a, a big chasm between the way cosmologists would treat this versus like effective field theorists in, in, in particle physics. But cosmologists will often, you know, actually live on, live on those higher derivative corrections uh, uh, and R squared gravity and so on. But in flat space perturbed amplitude, these things are pretty simple, which is that, you know, we think of those higher derivative corrections as things generated by integrating something out. So we would just think of them as a kind of power correction that we'd add. But uh, the, the upshot of what I want to say is like, whatever you want to assume about your asymptotic states, like whatever your free wave equation is, just input that. But if you get ghosts, it'll be your fault because if your wave equation has ghosts, then you'll have ghosts. Um, and it's your, if you like, you could build a consistent amplitude and try to find coupling such that the ghost modes decouple. You could try to do that. I don't know if anyone actually tried doing that. Um, if you like, you know, actually someone has tried doing that for massive gravity. Actually, you, you could you can do this bootstrap for massive gravity where the uh, the the um, Bulwer desert ghost shows up the one that famously is eliminated in DRGT massive gravity but you could kind of build that theory from just the principles of amplitudes which is to try to like eliminate ghosts in the scattering okay so you can apply this procedure for ghosty theories where you kind of build something and then demand absence of ghosts but I'm also kind of being more open-minded. And if you just want to have ghosts in your propagators and you're maybe more uh, liberal with your views, then you could also do that too. Uh, I think all I'm saying is all this is is uh, a complex analysis, at least the bootstrap I'm saying today. Um, there's other consistency conditions, of course, but then you check those in the kind of standard way where I give you an amplitude and I check its optical theorem and I check that there's a positive definite uh, spectral density and so on. <clears throat> Can I, can I ask another question? Sure. On the track, the, you're imposing, you're taking one of the plug to the uh, momentum, and it's kind of the word identity you are chosen, right? For the open right. uh, amplitude. So, what if you, uh, you're, you're assuming certain gauging variance for now? Uh, well, no, I think well, the statement here is really just, you, you. of course, we derive it normally from like a full gauge invariant structure where we say there's a Lie algebra and then this and that and F mu nu and, and connection and so on. But what are we really yeah, saying yeah, when so I say, so you, what am I really saying when happening? Sorry, the gauge invariance is not necessary you know, because I'm, I'm thinking oh, of sorry. some, somehow you're, 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 you're breaking the gauge invariance somehow. Let's say for higher spin field, you will giving mass to higher spin field somehow, then uh, maybe that is the breakdown of some higher spin gauge in their Then uh, you, So are you I asking mean, about the massive case or the masses case? The massive. I mean, if you, this is the case for massless um, general spin space. And if you, you have a massive uh, spin space, uh, then that is, um, the polarization vector equal to momentum is it still uh, applicable. Good. So for the massive case, you can actually still do this. So I, you should look at this paper by uh, Kurt Hinterbickler and Rachel Rosen, where they literally do this for the massive case. And in that case, you can still define a tensor for the higher spin massive state. P dot E still is equal to zero because it's still transverse to the to the momentum. It's not a longitudinal mode. It, it, it's, you know, 
the 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 momentum vector is one comma zero 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 zero, right? Because it's a massive particle, but the little group is still the SOD minus one. So the, the, you could still define the polarization to be transverse to P, which is what they do. So they build that full bootstrap, and of course they find more solutions. It's actually very interesting. Some of the solutions are massive gravity. Some are like different variations. It's actually quite cool. But I, you should look at that exercise there because they have everything: mass terms, higher spin, coupling to gravity. That whole set of papers does this uh, 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 in its full glory. Yeah. But yeah, it all works the same. You just have to adapt the assumptions to having a mass, uh, as, as you're asking about. <clears throat> Uh, I think the time is uh, already quite uh, late, so maybe we, uh, we can close the uh, today the previous uh, lecture here. Let's thank you again. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. And uh, I, I think the routine, uh, like yesterday, could we have a 20 minutes break and start at 11 10? Uh, yes, yeah, sure, no problem. I'm sorry about, about this. Yeah. I, yeah, so we'll meet at 11 10. And you think, are you going to use a blackboard or uh, are you going to do like yesterday? Uh, I think that maybe uh, just doing, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do like yesterday. This is. Ah, okay, good. Thank okay. you. Yeah, that's right. good. Thank you.